Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to HDB's Monitor Farm Monday's webinar. Uh, my name is Philip Dolbert. I'm based down in the southwest of England, uh, HDB's Seals North Seas Manager for, for the region. Uh, I'll introduce our fellow speakers tonight shortly, but firstly, I've just got a few quick housekeeping uh, points to run through. Regular listeners will be used to these. Uh, if you're if you're new to us this evening, very warm welcome especially, and uh, just keep your ears pegged back for a few instructions. First thing to say is that you're all on mute, so we can't hear what you say, uh, but you can get in touch with us via the chat box, which is in the grey bar on your right-hand side of your screens. Please feel free to submit questions uh, for, for us as the panel and we'll, we'll address those as they come in or at the end uh, as appropriate. Due to finish at 8, possibly at 15, depending on how the discussions run. Uh, but uh, as it says on the right there, the, the webinar is going to be recorded. So if you have to buzz away or, or have to leave and, and want to catch up later, there will be a recording uh, on our, our YouTube channel posted later and you'll get an email uh, tomorrow probably just confirming the, the link to that. Uh, there, there is a basis and rosa points available tonight. Uh, the way to get those, uh, for those who haven't done it before, is using the chat function. Uh, if you put your details in there, we will add them to the register and log those in. Just a reminder that for bases, you need to put in your name, account number and postcode. But for Neuroso, you also need to add to your name, membership number and postcode. You need to add your date of birth. If, um, if you don't get them into the uh, chat function there tonight, uh, you can catch up afterwards. Just drop them in an email to me, uh, philip.tolbert at ahtb.org.uk. And, and the final thing to say is for those of you that are social media savvy and uh, have got uh, Twitter handles, please feel free to tweet away from this evening and share, share what you hear and learn and uh, use the hashtag monitor farm uh, symbol as well. Okay, so just moving on, this is uh, getting towards the end of our winter series of meeting now, which has been a very different winter for us, uh, all digital, and uh, the Monitor Farm Monday webinars has been a key part of that. Tonight, we're, we're addressing uh, the subject of lean management, and the last one next Monday is, is on cover crops, intercropping, and companion cropping, which is uh, clearly a very hot topic as well at, at the moment. So as, as this is at the end of the season, it's that time of year when we start to start to look back and review and reflect. And there is a survey which we would really, really appreciate you spending 10 minutes to go through and answer. Uh, it, it, we will change things going forward. I, mean, I suspect, we're hoping we have some meetings, but there will be some digital input as well. So all feedback we can have about how you found the program this past winter be very much appreciated. And as an incentive for one lucky entrant, there will be a hamper available to, to, to for your troubles. So much appreciated. I'll remind you again of that at the end. So, so one of the advantages of, of the, the, the digital winter has been we've, we've not been restricted to regional. We've been able to draw on our monitor farmers from all over the country. Uh, and tonight I, I'm delighted to be joined by Ben Jeans, our Salisbury monitor farmer, and also Andrew Booth, who was a, a monitor farmer a couple of years ago now up in Aberdeenshire um, and, and Andrew went through the, the lean process then and I thought it'd be really interesting to get his perspective a few years a few years on. Uh, and last but not least tonight joined by Neil Fedden uh, of, who's uh, runs his own company and is a lean management expert and, and has been the integral to the whole process uh, that we're going to talk about tonight so a very warm welcome to all our three speakers. There is, or well, there are, should I say, many, many challenges going ahead. And, uh, you know, the old adage, you can't measure it, you can't manage it, really comes to the fore in all of these areas, really. And, and lean management is just one aspect of this used in conjunction with uh, the, the other tools at HDB. And there are many of them got available. They're all on the website. Uh, two key ones, uh, Christian, if you just flip forward one, which you'll have come across I'm sure is farm bench which is actually a core part of the work tonight because it's provided much of the information to to talk about some of the the processes that we're going to debate and and as you if you're not all familiar with the website there's lots of other information there not least the Brexit impact calculator where 
we can start to come to terms with what our budgets will look like without um, without the government um, European money in the equation. Well, that's enough of that. We'll, we'll move on now to, to tonight's topic because that's, that's the main point of, of interest. I, and as always, it's always interesting for us as on the panel here to get a sort of a bit of a snapshot of, of who's listening and what sort of experience you've got. So we've got two questions here to ask you. Uh, usual format for those who've done it before, just click on the screen uh, on one of the circles and it will give a, give us an instant uh, poll of, of what sort of audience are, are listening in tonight. And, and that helps us to, helps us where to gauge uh, the discussion as well. I don't know how quickly those are coming in, Christian, but we'll fairly soon have a an output from that. So there we are. We've got a, a lot of farm managers with us tonight, uh, and, and some employees, and, and, and others from the from the industry as well. So that's 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 good to know that. And then. The, the next question is is to to find out what sort of experience you as listeners have of of lean so far so the first option is you never even heard of it don't know what we're going on about uh, but uh, or you have heard of it and not done anything with it or you have heard of it and done something with it so if you'd like to click away then we'll get a feeling of how much you've dipped your toe in the water on the on the subject of, of lean management So how does that look now? So I guess that's that's probably what we'd expect. Sort of half and half have heard about it, and many many of you sort of not well, not so many of you have done done anything with it so far. But perhaps tonight we'll be able to sort of uh, unlock your your thoughts and open your eyes and give you some indicators of how you could uh, make use of the process in your business at home. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to to Neil. Who will introduce the the concept of, of lean management and just explain the the underlying theory of it all so all being well we've seamlessly transitioned to neil having control of the slides and he'll he'll talk us through his section so welcome neil thanks philip and uh thanks everyone um good evening my name's neil fedham uh, and as philip says what i'm gonna do is just give you a bit of an overview of of what lean is uh, as a topic, and, and then more specifically, is, is try and bring it to life a little bit with the uh, the case study from from Ben's farm and uh, Ben kindly horses on site uh, to use the techniques within the lean toolbox in, in order to demonstrate how it can be applied uh, to improve business productivity. So, just a little bit of background as to what lean is, and this is basically lean on a slide. Uh, these are all the sort of like the prints, the five principles down the middle with the arrow, and then some of the tools and techniques around the outside of the of the five principles. And essentially, it's a, it's a business improvement technique that originated in Japan, uh, originated in the automotive industry, um, and really came across into the UK in the 80s and 90s when uh, Nissan, Toyota, and Honda set up their manufacturing facilities. Uh, it was what were they used uh, to educate the uh, the supply chain. Uh, they had these wonderfully efficient manufacturing sites dotted around the UK, and uh, the UK supply chain uh, needed to improve in order to keep these factory, factories running at their, uh, their high levels of efficiency they were used to in Japan. Um, so a lot of um, the, te the lean techniques have really evolved and developed in, in Japan, but have then spread themselves through the UK supply chains. And then from automotive, it moved to aerospace, uh, from aerospace, it moved into general manufacturing. And then around about 14 years ago, uh, we set the business up to focus in on the essentially the non-manufacturing sector. So we started getting a lot of inquiries in from a whole host of businesses that were looking to apply lean uh, to, their, to their own organisations. And, and essentially what it is, it's a, it's a systematic way of analysing the processes within the business and understanding where the waste is. And then once you understand where the waste is, look at what you can do to, to reduce down the amount of waste, therefore to improve the amount of productivity. Uh, and the five principles, essentially the first thing we do is understand the value. So what is it that the customer wants from, from the business? What is it they're willing to pay for? And the second is we understand the value stream. So how, what are the process stages in taking the input into the business through to the final output and delivering that to the customer? Uh, flow is all about how can we eliminate as much waste as possible to improve the flow of product 
and the flow of value. Uh, pull is, is all about sequencing the operations to the customers as much as possible, um, which in, in organic crop situations where you've got a, a, an organic product, sometimes that can be in a challenge in itself. Um, perfection is, is essentially all about continuous improvement. It's uh, lots and lots of small marginal gains. Uh, any of you that have followed uh, Team Sky or uh, Team Ineos, as it's known now, they'll know there's a, there's a director of marginal gains. And, and essentially, that's what this perfection element is all about. It's getting uh, people to identify all the little improvements that can be made to the, to the process. And uh, those aggregated up actually make quite significant improvements to the business productivity. So that's the, the fifth element. And what you've got around the outside of this slide are the various tools and techniques that are within the, to, the Lean toolbox. Just uh, zooming in on the, uh, this, this concept of, of value and waste uh, within a business, uh, and this really came to, came to light when we started looking uh, within Ben's business, which is, is looking at all the different elements uh, of what we classify as, as non-value add. And uh, it's, it's non-value added in, in the widest context. So it's looking at uh, whether there's too much transportation materials around the organisation, uh, where there's too much stock, where you've got people walking backwards and forwards, again, in and out of, of tractors, uh, where there's waiting and delays. So either waiting for uh, access to equipment, waiting for materials or waiting for decisions to be made. Um, overproduction, so producing more than what's required and more than what can be sold. To the customer, over processing, that might be carrying out too many activities, going over and above the specification, for example, that's what's required by the uh, by the end customer, uh, and defects where you've you've not hit the specification for whatever reason, and uh, it either it can't be sold or requires some form of rework. And essentially, what you're trying to do is to reduce with lean the application of lean is to reduce down this waste. So reduce down the amount of non-value add to free up more and more capacity to do value added activities. And therefore, by doing more value add, uh, hopefully what you can do is you can increase the, uh, the value and the sales of the business. Or you can create more capacity for the people within the organisation in order to develop the business itself. And, that, and this is where the term lean comes from. Lean it basically refers to eliminating as much waste as possible from the process. So this is just an example. Uh, these are the kind of things that we've done. Um, a few case studies, basically, of where we've applied the principles. This is where we're mapping out the value stream. So we use a technique called process mapping. And the yellow post notes are where we're breaking the, the process down into all its small incremental wow. stages. And we're looking at the distance travelled and the time taken to do each stage of the process. Uh, and then we're getting the team that's been involved in doing this process mapping activity. We're getting them to identify where the value is, uh, where the ideas are for improvements, and where the waste is within the business. So by hopefully by breaking it down this way and analysing as much of the process in as much detail as possible, you start to identify where these eight wastes are, but then more importantly, where there's opportunities to actually improve the organisation itself. And uh, just building on that, as mentioned, the yellow post notes, we're recording down the distance and the time taken uh, to carry out the activity. Whether the step is a, is a waste, so if it's yellow, uh, normally we classify that as non-value add. And then when it's pink, um, a pink post note normally indicates that's a value add stage. That's something the customer is willing to pay for. And that those eight ways that I went through are usually what's on the, uh, the yellow post it notes. So by breaking it down that way, by getting everybody's input, everyone can then start to have a say where the issues are in the business and then hopefully where the areas are for, for improvements. And typically what you find within the business is because you're, you're involved within it, you're so focused on the task, you're, you're, you've got lots of pressures on you as an organisation and business owners, sometimes the way start to become the norm, uh, you stop seeing them after a while, they just became, become the normal way of working. And it's only when you look at the, the process in this detail and you break it down like this that you actually start to see where the, the opportunities are for actually improving the process. So it's just a way of, of really stepping back and stepping out of the process 
and then looking at it with these uh, these critical eyes and looking at what can be done to improve it. And uh, this is where the, what we try to do is go through every single yellow post-it notes that we've got, all the waste activities, and say, look, can we eliminate this? Is there a better way of doing it? Uh, if we can't eliminate it, can we reduce down the amount of time that it takes? So we, we reduce down the, uh, the work content within that particular step. Or is there any way of combining it with something else? So we've got two activities happening at the same time. And then hopefully by doing that, what that does is compress the overall lead time of the operation itself. And uh, by systematically going through each process step and looking at it this way, hopefully what we start to do as well is to actually simplify the process. And uh, by simplifying it, uh, we reduce down the chances of mistakes. And also what we'll start to do, hopefully, is make it easier to bring people into the business and to train people up in these processes as well. From the ideas that come out of the, uh, the process mapping activity, um, obviously, you can't fix everything. Um, it'd be nice to do so, but the reality of it is uh, everyone's time constrained and everyone's resource constrained. Um, so you have to pick and choose which parts of the process you're going to work on and which ideas are you going to work on. So we just use a very, very simple matrix and we'll, we'll demonstrate this from um, the case study from Ben's form. All we do is get a flip chart. We split it up into four. Um, you've got one axis, which is ease of implementation. So is it easy to do? Is it hard to do the, the improvement idea? And then on the other axis, we've got, is it going to generate low benefit? Or is it going to generate high benefit? And with all the ideas that are up on the process map, we take each one, we hold it up against this matrix, and we're literally asking those two questions. Easy to do, hard to do, low benefit, high benefit. And then wherever it, for, wherever it lands, the answers to those two questions, that's where we place it on this 2 by 2 matrix. And, and hopefully what you get are lots of ideas going into this top left-hand category. They normally do, normally that, this is the case, uh, which are easy to do uh, and high impact on the business. So therefore, they're, uh, they're relatively low cost, not a great deal of time associated with uh, carrying out the improvements. But what they'll do is they'll actually generate some benefits to the business in terms of eliminating waste and freeing up time for the people to operate within that particular business. So that's essentially what we're trying to do as we're going through and analysing each of those individual steps. So Thanks. basically that's the theory. Um, and then Ben will talk through the, uh, the practical side of it from an application. Thanks, thanks, Neil. That's a really good uh, ten-minute summary of quite a thick textbook. So uh, you've done a, you've done a great job there. Um, what we thought we'd do tonight, um, folks, is sort of take you through the process that we went through with Ben. So uh, I was given that sort of brief understanding of, of, of lean, like like you just heard. Then I took it to Ben and said, "How about a lean review, uh, Ben, on the business?" And uh, and and we thought you. Just briefly now, go have a brief section with Ben to sort of hear his initial thoughts and reactions, and then we'll go back to Neil to talk through what we actually did on the farm, and then come back to Ben again to to sort of review at the end of the process what what Ben got out of it. So without further ado, now I'll hand over to to Ben who just give you a brief uh, summary for those that may be a bit further afield from Salisbury and and haven't had the chance of, of hearing about the Salisbury Monitor Farm, and then talk about what his thoughts were as approaching and entering into a lean management review with, with Neil. So Ben, over to you. Right, th thanks a lot, Philip and, and Neil. Um, sorry to drag everyone away from their busy uh, busy spring drilling programme, but um, but yeah, I'd like to introduce you to, to, to the farm to start with. Um, can we just have the next slide, please, uh, Neil? Um, so, um, so a brief overview. We, Chalkwood Farm is um, it's based near Broadchalk in Salisbury, Wiltshire. Um, it's an 830 hectare family owned downland farm uh, with about 530 hectares of arable um, alongside a 180 cow um, Holstein awesome carving dairy unit on a liquid milk contract with Sainsbury's. Um, it's a closed herd. We rear our, all our own basements. Um, we also run a, a small 350 ewe lamb gibbering enterprise on the downland um, and the whole farm is in a higher tier countryside stewardship um, agreement 
Um, alongside this, we converted some farm buildings um, and have a mix of residential and commercial property lets. Uh, we employ three full-time staff, three part-time staff, alongside my father, Andrew, and myself. Um, most of the ground is, is, well, most of the arable ground is boys' ground, sort of grade three chalky loams. Um, and the dairy grazing platform is on green sand, so despite being a bit droughty, it does allow for an extended grazing season, um, which keeps costs down. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so, lean preparation. Um, when Philip suggested the idea of a lean review to me, I've got to admit, I was slightly sceptical um, with all its sort of buzzwords and acronyms. Um, my mind was flooded with, with images of a sort of David Brennan type character turning up at the office and, you know, telling me that I was getting everything wrong and had a farm and, and all that. Um, but fortunately, this wasn't, wasn't to be the case. Um, so we started off by mapping out the business um, with the aim to identify the areas which would potentially have the most opportunity for efficiency gains. Um, really, to me, it was fairly obvious that although I appreciate this is an arable monster farm group, project, um, most of the gains were going to be in the, in the livestock routines. Um, the dairy unit here is, like many across the country, really, it's, it's grown in a sort of piecemeal fashion over many decades of technological change. And as a result, there are many constraints to efficiencies in, that, in our dairy unit, which we, which we accept as just part of the, part of the, you know, part of the deal. Um, but the livestock feeding routine, the daily livestock feeding routine would be an example, um, a really good example of where we can can save time potentially because it's so repetitive, so time consuming. Um, and we do it every day from you know from August to, to April. Um, so that was one we, we aimed The other side, well, on the arable side, it's a bit harder because we came out of a joint venture um, four years ago in 2017 uh, with three neighbours and, and took the arable back in hand. Um, and I was sort of fortunate enough to have a bit of a blank slate to, to re gear up with. Um, so I like to think that we got it relatively close to, to, to being fairly efficient in that we, you know, we didn't have too many of this, this sort of historical ties holding us back. Um, but, you know, although there aren't so many repetitive processes in arable farming, as there are with livestock, um, the obvious repetitive process that, that I think where we could still save time is the spray fill-up process, um, which is such, a, is such an important one to save time on because it always happens during a really busy period when you're trying to get on and get stuff done. So that was, that was the obvious one there on the arable side. Um, you know, it would really potentially improve time in this if we could if we save a few minutes here and there. Um, the other obvious obvious area of time saving would be in the office. Um, like most um, multi-enterprise farms, we, we receive thousands of invoices every year, which we have to deal with, um, and that's management time taken up. Um, many of those invoices we receive in, in paper format, um, and so we still run a paper office um and um there are clearly going to be management time saving opportunities here um so so that was the other sort of area that we really earmarked um as an area for, for some lean efficiency gains um and i think over to you for the next slide now thanks ben. neil if i just neil if i just butt in i think that maybe ben, ben made the point but i just sort of re-emphasize it that though he talks about sort of we looked at a dairy example and looked at the spray filling example, but really that it was very difficult to split the two, wasn't it, Ben? Because uh, you know the, your staff help out with each other's enterprises. So although we, we classify them as one as dairy and one as arable, in, in practice it's a whole farm uh, exercise where we needed to pull in uh, the experiences and operations of, of both enterprises. Yeah, exactly. Ben, yeah. yeah. I think mean, being a mixed farm is, is you know, we're, we're, we're a fairly true mixed farming that we do, we do sort of overlap through you know, the staff and machinery through all the enterprises. So, so it's all, all part of the same, very much the same. Um, they're, very, they're very tied together, the two, the two enterprises. Yeah. Okay, so back to you now. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Ben. So, yeah, this is really the, uh, the approach that we take. Um, so, the first thing you do is you do what we call a current state process map. Uh, which is fairly self-explanatory. You map out what's currently occurring within the within the operation, and as you're doing that, you're identifying where there's opportunities for improvements uh, and where the waste is. 
uh, and prioritizing those using that uh, prioritization matrix that I showed you earlier. Um, and then from that, you then start to think about what could the process look like. Um, so you start to sketch out a, a redesign of the process. Normally what we do, the great thing about uh, doing the current state map and putting onto post-it notes and writing down the times and the distance involved, when you get to step four, it's very easy to then start doing a cost-benefit analysis. Um, you can actually calculate what the anticipated time saving was by all the yellow post notes you can basically remove uh, from the process map. And then you can start looking at what the costs are associated with those particular changes. So before you're even actually doing any physical changes, you can get a, a rough cut feel as to whether it's a viable uh, improvement activity. So that's what we normally do as a step four. And then step five is to put together an action plan uh, and to actually start the implementation itself. So that's normally the format that we take when it comes to improvement, and certainly the one that we did with uh, with Ben's form. So as, as Ben mentioned, uh, we identified this was uh, there was a lot of regularity around this particular routine. It was a daily routine, uh, and therefore it was potential for, for some good savings within the operation. So this is where we're doing the process map. I'm also doing a string diagram. So this is a, a drawn out layout. Of, uh, of the, the form itself, not to scale, uh, but basically it just gives us an idea and indication of all the different routes that are taken as part of the process. So each line refers to, to a, an operation, um, a distance travelled either by a tractor or by, by Ben or one of his staff actually walking around the form itself. So it starts to give us an indication of where there's lots of routes and lots of distance travelled on a particular part of the process itself. This is where we've got the process map. So in this instance, we've written down the description of the process stage. We started to record down the distances and the times. You can see at the bottom of the post notes, and then what you've got around it are all the problems that were identified. Um, and these, these problems are identified by talking to Ben, talking to members of staff that carry out this routine on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and this is a great thing about making it visual like this. You get as many people as possible involved uh, and really get some uh, pull the experience of the individuals that work day to day uh, in the operation itself. So this is where we're uh, we're doing the current state process map. This is just more of the same really, showing the the string diagrams and how they relate to, relate to the uh, the current state itself. And then what we're doing then is we're challenging each part of the process and just questioning the reason why it's carried out that way and whether there's a there's a better way of carrying out those individual process steps. This is the detail. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go for every single line on, on this particular activity and this particular process, but what you've essentially got is a description of the, the process step. You've got how long it takes to do. Uh, we've adjusted it to minutes. Um, sometimes it could be hours, it could be days. Uh, some companies are going to, they're over a longer period of time. So it really depends on, on the business and the frequency of operations. And then what you've got on the far right column or is the uh, the distance uh, and then, then what you've got down at the bottom are the totals to carry out these particular activities so you can just see it's two hours every single day the distance as distance of 3.5 kilometers is traveled and it can be quite surprising with these daily routines just how quickly sorry how much time they can uh, potentially take up out of uh, out of the activity and daily daily uh, agendas this is the problems, talking to Ben and his staff as we went through and we did the process mapping, we were teasing out all the problems. So these are all the issues that were identified. So we started to, to list them down at this stage in no particular order. And then using that prioritization matrix, that easy to, hard to do, low benefit, high benefit, we're going through all the ideas from the process map and basically put them up onto the matrix and prioritizing which are the ones that we're going to focus in on and this top left hand corner is always the part of the uh, the matrix that we always look at and they're the ones that we always start off with obviously if it's if it's hard to do and it's high benefit that's going to be a longer term or normally if it's hard to do there's a bit of investment required um, there's a bit of lead time associated with doing that particular activity but to counter that we know we're going to get a good payback from it so it tends to be more of a uh, a medium term project activity when it's in that top right hand corner. This is now where we started to pull together the action plan. So we've uh, we've done the current state, we've uh, looked at all the issues, we've prioritised those issues, 
what we're starting to do now is work out what improvements could we do what's the potential cost of doing those improvements and how much time will it uh, will it save so it just allows us to start prioritizing and say look there's a really good payback on these ones these are the ones that we need to focus in on and then what you've got as well is you've got who's responsible for carrying out that activity and when we potentially plan to carry out that, uh, that act. so there's a very clear defined action plan with this is the action this is the payback the, this is who's responsible and this is the anticipated date for completion and uh, at the bottom of the action plan what we've done on this one we've calculated two things this is how much time it'll save the business on the right so uh, 300, just short of 370 hours and then this is how much time it'll save Ben which is uh, 85 hours so and this is where I always come back to which is you know, hopefully what it's doing is it's freeing up capacity from uh, the, the senior management team within the business itself to get to allow them more time to think about what else they can do within the business uh, so perhaps there's, uh, there's a business strategy of, of diversification or a business strategy of wanting to grow the business and, and look at other areas of opportunity or spend some time actually looking at other areas for improvement and, and everybody's short of time so hopefully by saving this time within the senior management team it frees up some capacity to think about some of these longer term actions for the business itself. This is looking at the other route, daily routine we identified, so similar sort of thing, looking at the, uh, the spray process. So same thing again, string diagram to highlight the routes as part of the spray process. Cross this mapping out using post-it notes and getting everybody's input into the process itself. These were the ideas that came out of it that leads into Ben's presentation. So these were some of the initial ideas that we came out of. The, uh, the process mapping and the action planning. You're not going to be, as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to be able to do every single action. You have to prioritise. And the reality of it is when you actually start to trial some of these ideas, not all of them are going to work. Um, normally, the reality of trying some of the ideas, some of them fall out because they're just not feasible. So by identifying quite a large number in the first instance and then prioritising those, you then basically set up a series of trials to just to verify that it actually is going to generate the savings that you predicted as part of the process mapping stage. So this is uh, the next stage we're at now, which is to identify the problems and the ideas for fixing those problems, which then become a series of trials to verify the improvements. So this is the same thing again. This is the, uh, the waste walk, so breaking it down into the detail of all the incremental steps. Uh, you've got the individual times there on the on the left hand side and then you've got the distance on the right. You can also see there's two other columns and uh, we'll send you these blank templates out. You've got a uh, number of times done per week so what you might find is that there's certain elements of the process that are carried out every day or several times a day. There's others that are only carried out once or twice a week. So by just putting, recording the frequency that an operation is carried out, it just again allows you to then start focusing on which are the ones that are the highest routines uh, which will increase the potential amount of savings that can be achieved and then we've got uh, either whether it's value add or non-value add so we can uh, we can go through and assess to see whether is this something that adds value that the customer is willing to pay for or is it one of the uh, the eight ways that we talked about previously so there's we'll send you these templates out but it's a, it's a really good way of using these just to sort of like analyze and review the process and then work out ways of actually improving it and then this is the action plan for the serial side of things. So again, working our way through once we've identified all the, the ideas from the prioritization matrix, then working our way through and looking at you know which are the ones that have uh, got the best payback uh, and the ones that are easiest to achieve, therefore I've got a higher priority, and which are the ones that are more medium term actions uh, that are a bit longer term um, because there's a little bit of time and a bit of resource required to make them a reality. Okay, over to you, Ben, for, for your side. Great, um, thanks a lot, Neil. Um, so, as you saw from, from Neil's um, slides, um, there's a, a sort of matrix of, of importance, um, importance and, 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 and sort of cost, and um, there are a huge number of outcomes 
um, which um, which were identified in this in this sort of three day review. Um, um, I'd love to say we've sort of looked into all of them and and, and every single one we've actioned, but um, we haven't obviously got time to or had time to do that yet. But we started on on the ones which were sort of the most achievable, um, you know, the, the the ones which were least you know, lowest cost, um, highest impact. Um, and the most obvious one to start with, or for me to take you through just briefly without boring you, was uh, on the dairy feed process. Um, so we, an incredibly boring, boringly simple sort of solution. We doubled the side of our feed bucket. You know, we, we spent, I spent 1,200 pounds on a, on a new grain bucket. Um, from my own experience of feeding out enough to speak to the farm staff, it turns out there's absolutely no reason why we're using a sort of small bucket to feed, feed the TMR with every day. Um, Instantly, with this double-sized bucket, we were saving at least 10 minutes, probably more, every day from August through to April. Um, that's 33 hours a year of man and JCB time, which I sort of John Nick's figure would be about 40 pounds an hour um, for. So instantly, that's 1,332 pounds a year. Um, so in theory, we've already paid back the investment you know, already um, in, in one season. Um, in addition to that, there's obviously all the sort of accuracy gains in, uh, from, from having the, the, the process taking less time. Um, after Neil left, we, we sort of did our own other lean reviews. Um, and one that I focused on, because I knew it was inefficient, was our Youngstown feed process. Um, we identified the inefficiencies of dealing with bale silage, uh, both from a sort of time and, and, and sort of feed wastage point of view. Um, we invested in a bale splitter on wrapper. Um, and we estimate this saves about 45 minutes every other day um, throughout the, the sort of how season, um, which works out about 45 hours a season. Again, if, if you look at 40 pounds a man, JCB hour, um, that's 1,800 pounds a year. The attachment costs 2,800 pounds. So payback in theory is one and a half seasons. Um, and that's before you factor in uh, the reduction of obviously wasted silage um, for a more precise rationing out. Um, and in addition, um, the job's safer, um, there's less time spent hobbing in and out of, of the JCB and also being in sort of with the heifers, as it were. Um, we moved on, moving on the, the spray fill up area. Um, this is still a work in progress. Um, it's going to be factored into a larger project for a sort of purpose built spray fill up station. Um, but we are in the process of converting um, an old yard box yard scraper from the dairy into a chemical carriage to sit on the front of with our, our main spray tracks front linkage, which should save a lot of journey up and down to the spray point from the chemical store. Um, we've also investigated the use of IBCs for glyphosate. Um, but strangely, the best price um, glyphosate in an IBC was still um, sort of 20, 30% and more than we're currently paying um, in its current format. Um, there must be huge opportunities here for suppliers and growers to, to save save costs and I'm surprised it hasn't been sort of a more widespread uh, or rolled out more, more widespreadly. Um, in the office, um, I'm afraid um, we're yet to go paperless here. Um, I think it might have to wait until um, we have retirement from the older generation who's still involved um, or an extremely rainy day. Um, but there is huge potential savings here um, and and it's certainly a priority um, when, when we get time or we'll get around to it because um, it's management time that's saved, um, as, as we said, as Neil sort of highlighted. Um, Neil, could we please have the next slide? Uh, thanks. Um, so, in summary, um, it seems lean principles um, in agricultural terms or in, agri in the ag agricultural setting um, have the most effectiveness on repetitive processes. Um, and I imagine there are huge huge resource saving opportunities um, within the mega dairy sector, the pig and poultry sectors as well. Um, and while, while the lean process initially seems sort of rather laborious when you start doing it, but then it quickly becomes a sort of force of habit. And I found that since Neil's visit back in September, I often find myself doing sort of mini informal lean reviews of, of many of our daily routines. Um, it, it sort of shows how cumulative small savings, as, as Neil mentioned with the marginal review comment can add up to lumpy overhead savings um, such as you know machines or, or staffing requirements um, our new um, actually our new leader to the young stock process 
um, has enabled a veteran part-time member of staff on our farm to retire, um, and we haven't had to replace him. So it's, it's sort of an example of how, how it can actually have, have huge savings, which you don't necessarily kind of think of when you think of 10 minutes a day, you think, oh, that's not actually saving any time, or sorry, saving any money, because you know, we're still employing the same number of people and we still have the same number of JCBs and that sort of thing. But actually, if you do this lean review across across all your enterprises, um, you will um, you you end up coming up with a you know, huge number of um, the minutes per day or per, per year saved. Um, I also think it's highlighted how savings aren't always just the quantifiables, you know, the time and money, um, but also things like timeliness. Um, you know, the, the spray fill up process. Um, if we can shave 10 minutes off every time you fill the sprayer up, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's key time when during key weather windows. Um, and and there's, it's hard to put a price on that. Um, and things like sort of safety, um, you know, which, which often goes, particularly in the farming sector, famously, um, goes sort of, it's not, it's not prioritized enough sometimes. Um, and then there's the general team contentment and well-being um, from doing things well and efficiently at the same time. Um, so we certainly have plenty of resource saving plans on the horizon. Um, a lot of these processes, yeah, a lot of these um, sort of outcomes um, or processes we, we're yet to fully implement, um, but we've done a few. Um, and, um, and I think it's certainly helping the business, um, yeah, just, yeah, improve. Um, and keep costs down and, and generally um, head on the path to, to greater sustainability. Um, and I think that should help us um, in an era of in an era of reduced subsidies. Um, so I look forward to, to to analyzing more more sort of um, new concepts through the prism the prism of lean management, as it were. Um, but um, yeah, I'll hand over to, to Neil. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that, Ben. Great, great to hear uh, that you've already benefited and you've, you've still got the ideas firing away. Um, I have to say, as a spectator of the, the few days we spent with you back in September, it was just fascinating in particular seeing those string maps build up and that red line get thicker and thicker and thicker over certain operations. And it, it certainly concentrated the mind as to, to which operations really truly were repetitive and whether there was a way of making that big red line thinner. Anyway, I, I, I ramble. Um, back to the, the agenda. Delighted to welcome back to the uh, to the Monitor Farm um, stage, so to speak. Andrew, who is a Monitor Farmer, uh, two years of finished being a Monitor Farmer in Scotland with us two years ago now. Um, but Andrew was really a, a lean pioneer in the in our world, the Monitor Farm world, and, and did the review a little while ago. We thought it'd be useful for Andrew to come back and just uh, see what's happened and to reflect and and tell his story. So Andrew, over to you, please. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, a, it's been a few years, 2011, I think, is when we kicked off the Monitor Farm project, but uh, a, it's uh, and going by the stock image that HDB have got of my, um, from back in the day, if my hair is, lean hasn't helped my hair receding line much. So just uh, next slide, if you could, Christian. Um, yeah, so who, where, and what are we at Savic? So we're fourth generation farming business and um, we are located just north of uh, Aberdeen uh, on the on the coast and um, we grow cereals and renewable crops for an AD plant that is on the farm we are traditionally we were a mixed um, arable farm with a uh, with the fattening cattle beef livestock and such like but um, predominantly are just to focus now on, on the arable uh, we own rent and contract a 1800 acres of land and we have commercial and residential properties a on on the farm as well and we're also co-founders of uh, scotland's only accredited gluten-free um, oat mill which will reason for that is maybe come on to later on about customers and, and such like so next slide please christian so why did we do lean at um at savick um we were expanding our enterprises within the business. Uh, when, like I say, when we started back in 2011 uh, with the Monitor Farm, um, and then we were part of one of the big, best, the legacy we believe from the Monitor Farm was the Farm Bench or the, the business group. 
and we were we meet a number of times a year. One of the things was a the lean process was an opportunity to do that within within the business group. So we at that like I say at that point we're going through a bit of an expansion within the enterprises. We wanted to improve um, engagement with our expanding team. The acres were increasing, so was the team. Uh, we were we wanted to be customer focused and, and and let everyone understand why we're customer focused and understand waste more. And you know it's it's quite good that Neil and his, <laughs> much of what he was saying before um, I've, I've, we're uh, we're on the, we're on the same page. And and uh, waste was very interesting. And and waste is not uh, is not just about what you. Um, Actual physical waste, as, as Ben and, and Neil have alluded to, it's 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 time and, and other forms of waste are overproducing for your for your customer. And ultimately, we wanted to increase profitability. That was, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we were we were trying to do. So we were asked to to um, a, under, a, get a focus on on what our goal was. So you know, we could have said we wanted to reduce our power costs by. 2.45% of turnover and 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 uh, explain and explain why. But I think if we were trying to get engagement with the team, it would have it would have definitely fallen on 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 deaf ears. And 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 again, a Ben alluded to the the mixed enterprise and especially with livestock and and arable. And we've got obviously like Ben's commercial. It was trying to get part of the team to understand that. What happens in the commercial property operation is also important to what's is it just as important what's happening in the arable site and there's an overlap of their time and if they their time has to be spent on that fixing gutters or making sure roads are right um, for the tenants then that is equally as important so what rather than as i said rather than uh, focusing on power costs we made a um we set our, our stall out that, with the team that we wanted to increase productivity and effectively yield um and on our five-year average, um, quite substantially, so sort of circa 15, 20 percent over the next two years, and that really did focus the the, the minds. Um, and we engaged, like I say, with the whole team. So um, a, everyone who worked on the farm, whether it was on the farm, whether it was in the office, family, family are key to that. A, you know, my wife works very closely within the business. My father, although slightly was retiring or retired, is still involved in it. We engaged with him. A 70-year-old guy was involved in the lean process, and we engaged with stakeholders as well. So our main customers, and we we engaged with those uh, main customers and brought those guys in, those stakeholders, and our agronomists and and our precision farming guys all into the meeting. And we locked ourselves in a room for a day, and uh, we thrashed out the the uh, the process. Um, next slide, please, uh, Christian. So fortunately, the, we we started. We did exactly as uh, again as Neil said. So we we started at the right hand side with our customers, and find out really what they want because that's who we're producing for at the end of the day. And we created our uh, activities and and worked our way back to you know where it starts from, not just plowing the field, but effectively the fuel and the seed and and the bank and you know where it all really starts. You know where the whole business stands from. And we we worked our way through that, and and, and we um, we have a lot more pink in our one than uh, than what uh, Ben has. So we're clearly the greens are the goods, and the, the the pink and the reds are are the ones we can improve on. So we also had a huge amount more work to do. Um, but I think what this allowed us, every, again, it was about engagement, getting everyone to buy into it. And we, you know, they, we did. We had a great day. Everyone uh, understood what we were trying to achieve, and everyone got involved. And we wanted to. And if, next slide, please. So, as you can see, if you zoom in, you know we're kind of we're focusing where the numbers are. We focused in some on some key areas. So, soil health was one. You know, how can we improve on that, and why is that so important? And also, it, the what it means to the the folk working on the farm. You know, what makes their day easier? Things that maybe we don't see as managers and owners. Um, little things make a huge amount of difference, and that was a that was a massive a massive learning curve. So we um, dis, we you know we basically distilled the the bigger picture down to a slightly smaller picture of of some key areas, and a, under to understand exactly what to, where we were wanting to um, take 
take the business. So, next slide, please. So the second day was just the management team uh, within the farm, and we created our business plan. So effectively, down the right-hand side is the, the focused areas from the day before. Um, and we then had our a action list, which the, the section in the middle, and then we had exactly the same as what Neil had, the whens and the whos and the whos too. So uh, divvying, uh, um, divvying up the workload within the, within the team. So one of the one of the key elements of this was we were understanding at this point was where our, our customers and who, who they were. And as our, um, it became more apparent that you know 60% of the land that we were farming was either going to renewable or the oat plant, um, which was effectively where we were an element within some reason control of. And then 40% was commodity that we were having to play the market, you know, where we where we played a world market. So the focus very much came a uh, became the the two the sixty percent and delivering from that for them as well as a uh, making sure we weren't missing out on on the commodity markets and making sure we were focusing on the, on the right areas. Next slide, please. So what did we get from it? So this is these are just some um, of the. Um, Key tools that we have um, we have found or taken from the a monitor farm process or from, from the lean process. Sorry, the um, so in the background we've got our harvest packs. Now we've we've done packs for a number of years with all the information in a paper based system and benefit your pain. You know, paper is it, it does need. You know, we're trying we're trying to um, go uh, as digital as possible, but certain things still need to be written down. That was a great starting point for making under getting everyone to understand why we needed the the information. At the end the, the end of the year, we want to give our co contract farming customers um, their gross margin cost to the, that matches their um, cash book. So you know, de um, a, the detail is important. I think the key um, tool here is the T sheets one. Um, this is something that we challenged a couple of the people of the management team with after after the lean process in terms of trying to monitor guys um, hours. You know, at that time it was a paper system um, and a monthly one when folk were to have the handwritten down in week one when they couldn't really remember what they were doing and they would ask their, the other guy what he was doing and, and make it up from there. So we run this T-Sheets um, app which is part of QuickBooks, but we don't need to be part of QuickBooks with it. Um, and we've developed it to work for us. So in, in that, we can have chargeable and non-chargeable areas, um, a job sheets, and we can photograph uh, delivery notes or if they've gone to the, the local dealer to pick up um, parts or whatever. All this is documented on, on the T-Sheets app. Um, it is managed with it in the office uh, with their office manager, and she does keep and Don does keep on top of the guys. And if they haven't checked out, she'll soon tell them. Um, but the information we're getting from it is is unbelievable. It, it in, we are chargeable hours in the first year increased by thirty percent. So you know the value was was returned many many times. Open Way is another one where we have a. a Tradition, a, a farm Waybridge, which has the the, um, the unit in the at the Waybridge, which gives you the the printout. But we've linked up with Open Way, which is a remote system, which allows us to put it into farm much easier process than some of the farm ones. Um, a, in terms of inputting and then the information we're then getting out in CSV files um, is all done through a cloud-based system. A, we've recently taken home a new fueling station, which is through the fuel tech system. And again, so we're just kind of starting our first year with that, and that's going to allow us to drive or understand the cost better on our on our fuel usage. And uh, Microsoft Forms is something we've just really started in the last uh, couple of weeks, um, and spreading our digest that uh, the the weights coming over the Waybridge are given to the guy in the pump, who is then inputting that onto our forms. Which is basically like filling out a monkey survey, and that information then lands back in the office as a, again as an Excel CSV form, which means there's less input to be or, and less room for mistakes. And uh, we're like I say, we're just started that in the last couple of weeks, but uh, it's very encouraging what we're um, what we're finding from it so far. Next slide, please, Christian. So 
Outcomes for us for, so far, yeah, we've got a far better understanding of what the business requirements are. Um, our data, our use of data and, and the, our collection of data and what we do with it is, uh, is improved greatly. Improved our um, team engagement. It was a very, very worthwhile exercise. Um, something that, uh, the, you know, I think the, I certainly get the joked about that uh, if, I, if we're doing something on the farm and I, you know, I look at them and they look it back, and I can say, "Does it? Do you think that? Look, do you think that's lean?" So it's quite a good way of communicating the lean process. Um, we um, we certainly certainly this has been a good process in preparing for this meeting tonight, um, going through some of the old data, and that's really good. It's like a budget. I think we should be revisiting on a more regular basis. And we're um, we're certainly um, we've spoken about it before, and we're certainly going to um, uh, do that. Um, I'd say we're certainly much, or I'm certainly much better at delegating jobs. And you know, to be fair, our manager and, and and getting the is as well, which is then feeding out the team, which is giving the team more ownership within the uh, within the the whole place. Um, for example, today we're preparing for our virtual um, quality assurance inspection. And uh, not something that would probably take me um, all day or a couple of days to do or prepare for, because the data is on hand and uh, the, the, our farm manager and office manager are both pulling information together. I've actually had very little to do with it. Um, and the you know good work-life balance for all. You know that's something that was that came out of the the lean process that we want to, you know, we want to personally want a better work-life balance and that should be for everybody. And I think we, we, we you know, not saying we don't put in hours when we need to put in hours, but there's certainly downtime when we can have downtime and ultimately, which is driving profitability. Lastly, what I'd like to say is just that, you know, there were many of you listening in thinking, well, I do that on a daily basis. And I, and I get that there's, there's probably certain businesses that you, you don't, you, there's always something you can learn from it, um, but you'll be doing it naturally, and you know we do do it naturally. But it, it was for us with our for our business and our team. We believe it's been um, a fantastic process, and uh, like I said, this uh, preparing for the meeting tonight has been a great process for me because it's um, it's going to make me um, go and revisit some of the things of the. Well, I'm sure there's the when column in my in my list has not um, been fulfilled, and I should maybe go and revisit that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's really great. Clearly, it's a, a journey and an ongoing one. Um, just to uh, yeah, I put it in the chat, and we're, we're on to, to question time now. So, if there's a question you'd like to ask the individual panel as we go along, uh, please do put those in the in the chat function there on the right hand side, and I'll I'll aim to to get those addressed. And we've had some questions, some of which are a bit off topic, which we might not get distracted with tonight, otherwise this could be a very long evening. Um, but um, And the other thing just to remind you about, for those that are uh, on the bases and the ROSO uh, points, uh, to put your put your detail, membership details and so on in the in the chat function and we'll process those. Um, so, so to questions, uh, the, the first one, which is a sort of, uh, I'll perhaps have two questions in one here, but and it's to it's to all of you and perhaps we'll start with with ben uh, when you save time ben uh, what what does an employee do with that saved time and and as an employee um having an employee save time is what does that mean is it a true saving as such and i and i think the follow-up question and, and i might word it in a slightly different way is you know until you start losing whole labour units, is it very difficult to actually quantify the benefits from this? And so, three questions. For Neil, to come back to, um, you know, is there, is there a fear in terms of getting engagement of staff that this could be seen as a witch hunt to cut down labour costs and and and, and you know, people are voting for their own redundancies potentially? So, Ben, sorry, lots of questions. We'll, we'll kick off with your thoughts first. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's the thing in farming, isn't it? A lot, a lot of the overheads are, are very lumpy. Um, you know, a member of staff on a, you know, when we, we, we employ three full-time members of staff, um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that 10 minutes a day here and there is going to save a member of staff. Um, we actually employ quite a few, well, three part-time members, as, as I said, as well. And um, and so it does actually, with part-time members of staff, who you know, invoice by the hour, it does actually have a, you know, every 10 minutes is actually potentially a saving. 
Um, but also, I, I, more on a, a sort of bigger picture, is that they, people have more time to, to do jobs well. So they might actually still take the same amount of time over a job, but they'll just do it more accurately. They're less likely to damage machinery, um, but potentially, or you know, on weekends, they're, they're like to, you know, be able to spend more time with their families and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I know I know what you're trying to say, um, but actually, there are there are I think any any time saved is is is, 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 is it sort of more than the, what it what it seems like more than some of its parts really. Um, in farming, um, and I think with the, with the arable side, you know, timeliness is so important, and because um, you get such such small weather windows, um, probably even smaller where Andrew's farming. Um, but you know, the odd the odd 10, 15 minutes in a like a time like now, um, when you're trying to get everything done um, before, it, before it's going to rain on Wednesday, you know, is is key. Um, but Neil, you know, you'd probably be able to expand on that. I remember we did talk about that, Ben, didn't we? We worked out actually how many acres you could spray in a very narrow window because you'd saved 20 minutes in or whatever it was in every every three hours in the spray filling process. So yeah, it's interesting. Neil, have you got some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, when, whenever we're going and doing improvements uh, and we're encouraging business owners to look at um, their operations to carry out improvements, we're always conscious of the fact there's going to be a benefit for the business, uh, but there's also going to be a benefit for the individuals that, that work within the operation. I think Andrew alluded to it as well, uh, because obviously there's going to be a benefit for the business. It's going, to, it's going to pay for itself. But if there isn't a benefit for the individual, then the chances are it's it's going to be a temporary thing. People aren't going to work that way forever. They're going to work, work they're only going to work that way whilst people, they're being managed. And clearly, if, if they're made redundant uh, throughout the process, then that's not a benefit for the individual either. Uh, and if it becomes a one-off exercise, um, you know, so you, you involve people, you get their ideas and their input, and then if they're in, it's the first time somebody's made redundant from that, then obviously um, it's going to be, it is going to be a one-off exercise. So we're always very conscious of the fact that it's it's going to be sold as to make people's lives easier. Um, and then from the productivity side of things, uh, as both Ben and, and Andrew alluded to, it's, it's going to improve. You can either use those productivity improvements to improve life balance, um, or it could be used to allow more time for carrying out further improvements. Uh, so a beef farm that we worked on, um, they took the productivity improvements and they spent and invested that time into the grass management and creating a, a larger grass wedge so they can reduce down the, the feed costs. So I think by the, the first step is to free up the time by reducing the waste. And then the second step is to think how that time can be utilised in order to improve business productivity and profits. Andrew, two, two years on, what have you found with your staff? What's uh, really switch them onto it is it is it an extra 10 minutes at home for breakfast and lunch with the family or is it in the pay packet or is it just the pride of doing a job more efficiently i think it's a bit of everything actually I think it is that you know we've we we want as i said alluded to and the way we work with our guys is you know i'd rather they went home you know they're going to get they're we're, we're aiming in a salary based system you know they, i'd rather they did less hours for the same money or, or for more money that's where we're trying to what we're trying to achieve where we're trying to get to um and it is pride in their job and the so it is that it's a bit of everything and that waste thing is they're saying you know it's 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 wasted time it's trying to get them to understand that what they're doing is you know is wasted we we make we make decisions on whether it's actually worthwhile our guys doing it or you get somebody a, a subcontractor in to do it and because we're analyzing and checking out we can actually go well it's actually more cost effective for us to bring somebody else in with a tractor and a man because for that particular certain job it's actually more cost effective for them doing it than us mm. yeah uh, neil quick question for you perhaps because you'll have come across this in in many situations not just agriculture i suspect uh, how would a good way to start this process with people who have always done things their way be yeah, I mean, that's... AKA stuck in the muds. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think that's why with that process mapping activity we do with the post-it notes and, and sticking it up on the wall and involving people, uh, that's all aimed at that. Um, so rather than just coming in and simply saying, right, this is the way to do it, it's getting them to highlight their concerns and, and throw up all the issues that they've, they've had to live with 
over a period of time and by listening to those ideas and then converting those ideas into the action plan and by seeing those ideas being implemented hopefully that's when you start to convert people and, and get people to realize that this isn't it isn't just management speak people are serious about making changes uh, and hopefully that's how you win them over that way okay thank you uh, coming back to andrew question for you andrew have you actually managed to go paperless on timesheets uh, the, the questioner says that uh, they've developed an app for things like grey moving, which has saved countless hours, but struggling to find an easy for the staff timesheet data system. T sheets is we are completely paperless on with T sheets. It's an app on their phone, and we, nobody fills. They only u they use that um, all the time. So it's one hundred percent paperless. Okay, so that's on App Store, is it or? An App Store, yeah. T sheets on App Store. Highly recommend it. Okay, grand. Ben, um, you, you're sort of new to this really, and as you've already sort of got the bug by the sound of it because you, you've done, you've still already started doing some things beyond what we talked about with Neil. This may be an unfair question, but where do you see things going forward in two years' time if we have you back on a monitor farm webinar in two years' time? What, what do you think your business will look like because of the processes you've instigated yeah I mean, hopefully it will look slightly like Andrew's business looks like it's all it's very impressive um but yeah no I, I think I think there's, there's loads of things we can do still um and um I, I think yeah the use of use of sort of apps and um and, and, and general paperlessness I think is something that we need to look into more uh, not just in the office but but with 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 staff you know farm staff as well um, um Obviously, there are challenges to that um, with you know older generations of, of, of people working on the farm, um, and I think that could be could be challenging. But as, as young blood comes through, I think there's certainly huge efficiencies there. Um, so it's quite inspiring to see how Andrew's actually managed to implement um, sort of technology um, with the staff. And he's obviously got got the staff on board um, and, and engaged with that. And so I think that's an area I'd, I'd love to investigate further, actually. Um, but yeah, I think I think. Yeah, throughout every every sector, every enterprise and farm has, has areas which which we can we can improve um, through through this process. So um, just um, a bit, a bit more work to do. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Andrew alluded to it, and and certainly observed that with you, Ben. That it's very empowering to the staff, isn't it? And and you know that the solutions were coming from them. That was that's exactly what I was going to say to Ben. You know, that's that was the the great. It wasn't me trying to force it down anybody else's throat. You know, we posed a challenge that we all knew from our lean process. There was a challenge out there, and we posed that to a couple of them, and and they then took it to the rest of the team. They got a two week trial with it for nothing. You know, a and. Um, when after the trial they fed back and they were told by the rest of them and, and they all bought into it that way rather than rather than me standing at the top going you know, with the stick going you know this is what we're going to do so I think that was probably one of the, you know one of the the first lessons I took from that as well and if that one doesn't work for you know I'm saying t-sheets there are other <laughs> there are other options out there I know people I've spoken to have gone for different options and that might be the way is if you're trying, you know, put a few different options in front of them and say, like, come on, you guys come back because at the end of the day, you'll make it work. But if they can buy into it, then that's um, that's half the battle. Neil, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think I think you said it all there. I mean, it's, it literally is that it's trying to it's trying to involve people. It's trying to um, help people articulate their ideas. Uh, sometimes people's ideas come across as a bit of a gripe. Uh, but then when you start doing the process mapping and you, you actually record down or else the string diagram and you record down there how much time is involved and what distance involved in those particular activities and therefore how much how much it costs a business, it makes it so much easier to convert that gripe into a, a business case. And then from that business case, it allows the investment in the improvement, which again is is hopefully what gets people to buy into the improvements. Right, thank you. Jen, so I'm afraid um, time's beating us, but for those of you who haven't managed to get to your questions, we'll we'll come back to them afterwards. Um, but uh, I'll just uh, start to wrap things up now. We have got one final poll, and uh, please ask this honestly, uh, and, and it's not just for our benefit, but it would be interesting to feel whether there's any initial uh, 
change of mood from what you've heard over the last hour or so, um, so and, and whether you think you might take something forward um, to employing some of the process for your, for your own businesses. So if you just click away there. Little... Oh. Christian will be on the on the buttons behind. I'll just give it another five, ten seconds or so, getting a few more in. Yep. Thanks, Christian. It'll obviously just dictate whether we all as a panel go away and have a sleepless night or not, but uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, sure there'll be some. There we are. Oh, we're given some we're given some ideas. So thank you very much. But hopefully that's genuine as well. Um, but it's it's good to know that uh, we've perhaps part one or two ideas. For those that, um, that want to explore more on the HDB website, there is uh, a lean management page, uh, it, it, and that, it looks like that. But if you get when you get the recording of the video, you can you can look at that uh, link there, and, and it will lead you into that. Just a couple of quick extra points for me. Uh, why do things go on in HDB at the moment? We are in the middle, or rather, just starting Carbon Week. Uh, and there's a series of webinars each each day this week on various aspects of carbon management going forward. Uh, clearly, another another hot topic and potentially a, a lucrative one as well if we get it right in the in the agricultural industry. But uh, again, all, all details on the website. If you get stuck with anything or, or want to find out more about any subject, please do speak to your local uh, cereals and all seeds knowledge exchange managers. Uh, if you don't already know them, we're dotted around the country and, and always pleased pleased to help. Just before we go, a final nudge reminder about the Monitor Farm Survey. There's no such thing as bad feedback. Uh, we really would appreciate your, your comments and thoughts, thoughts going forward. So all that remains me to do now is just to thank very much uh, Andrew, Ben and Neil for your um, participation tonight, for your contributions, uh, real sort of down to earth practical uh, stories about making businesses more profitable which is at the end of the day what we're all trying to do but i think also crucially we picked up tonight and making that work-life balance uh, more attractive as well in, in the agricultural industry so a big thank you to you uh, and behind the scenes there's christian and uh, fiona have been beavering away so thank you very much for your invaluable support as ever finally to say uh, don't forget next week the last one of the series uh, Click on a register now if you haven't already done so, but we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, next week, same time, seven o'clock. So from us all, thank you very much for joining us. We've enjoyed your company uh, and look forward to, to the future. Good night. <laughs>